Dominic, is it recording now? Yes, here we go. So we put an engine out of a car there. Usually the way you pull the engine, you'll see somebody has uh, attached it to a rope or a chain. It goes over a pulley there. And there's somebody pulling in this direction. Tension. You see somebody yanking on that chain in that direction to lift that, bless you, you. to lift that engine out of the car. That actually pulling force, a lot of times you're going to live with the letter T. T for what? Why we use the letter T? Tension. The tension in the rope. So that's why we use T for when you have uh, strings there. Now, Newton's third law says for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. If I'm pulling on that chain here, I'm pulling in this direction. Notice I'm pulling in that direction. So what is the chain doing to me then? The chain is really pulling in that direction. The chain is pulling on me in that direction. That force T here, that means there's a force pointing upward in that direction also of T. If I'm pulling on it, I'm pulling on that one. So these forces, all of them in that chain are equal in value. All of them. Just the direction. Who's pulling in which direction? I'm pulling in this direction. The chain is pulling in that direction. On this engine, the chain is pulling, pulling up there. And this value has to equal to that. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So these guys are equal to each other and pulling in the opposite direction. Now you see actually that happens when somebody breaks their legs. You see them in the hospital, you go to visit them. And to, t to relieve some of the pressure on your body, sometimes they have this contraption that looks like this. You got a ceiling. From the ceiling you got like a little box here and a pulley there. And there's a rope that comes in around the pulley. Oh, actually, let me just throw a little bit. Let's reverse that. It might come, because I was about to put the person on that end, but I don't have any space on that end. I didn't plan it correctly. I'll attach it this way. Let's do the rope this way. I'll put the person on this end. The rope comes over the pulley there. The pulley comes, here we go. Down, there's the person's foot. I'm going to draw your foot there. I'm not, I wish I have talent. That's your leg there. We're well, not yours, the person that's sick there, broken leg here. And there's like, a, they have a special shoe there and you attach your foot to it and there's the rope pulling them. This end will go to another pulley here. And they dangle a weight. Usually the contraction will look something like this. And they hang a weight of mass M. And let's say you have an angle here, let's say, I don't know, this 40 degrees and 40 degrees here. But you see a lot of people with a broken foot just to pull on it, to stretch in that direction, or nick, that's what they do. They have a contraption in the hospital that will pull on you in that direction. Let's see, find the value of M if the force exerted on the side of the foot by the middle pulley is 165 Newton. So I want the mass M, find M, such that the force, now there are actually two forces on this really. But we want the force pulling because there's a fo there's this one is pulling in this direction, this is pulling in that direction. Well, they're going to have X components to them. This is going to have an X component in that direction, this will have an X component in that direction. I want the sum of these two forces to equal, what did I say, 150 Newton? Whatever number, it doesn't really matter what number we use. So how much weight do I need to hang here to give me a value of force of 150 Newton there?
Now let's look at the foot of that person. Let's do a free body diagram there. This is the foot again. Let's do a picture. Here is the foot. And let me put the x-axis right here and the y-axis, or here is the y-axis right there. And there's the x-axis. What are the forces acting on the foot? What do we have? Well, we have two ropes here pulling on you, right? And we have no idea if the forces are equal or not. So since I'm not sure, let me call this the tension in this cable T1, and let me call the tension in this cable T2. So I have T1 at what angle? 40. And I get T2 at angle 40 again. And why isn't your foot moving to the right? Because if you hang it, if this is free to move, what will happen? This weight will go straight down and your foot will go in that direction, right? So because your foot is actually pulling back in that direction. And we want the value of that force really to equal 150 Newton. That's where you want it to be. Because we want that force to be 150, you want that to be 150, so your foot is not moving. The whole idea is to stabilize your foot. If you want that force to be 150, then the combined result, that means your foot has to pull in this direction of 150, so your foot is staying in that position the whole time. Otherwise, if we start moving your foot, you'll be screaming. Still recording? Yep. So now let's look at these forces. Can we find out what T1 and T2 are? Well, we should be able to find them because we can break each one to X and Y component. Here we go, another free body diagram. So this is going to have a component in this direction and a component in that direction, the T1. The T2 is going to have a component in this direction and a component in that direction. So we have the 150 in this direction. This value pointing upward will be T1 sine of 40. And this is what? T1 cosine 40. T2 is going to have a component in this direction of what? T2 cosine of 40 and T2 sine of 40. So these are the four forces. We hope and with this contraption actually hold your foot in place. If it holds your foot in place, what do we know? We call that equilibrium. Your foot is now moving. That means the forces pointing upward have to equal what? Forces, forces point down. There is no net force in the y direction. Because if there is a net force, your feet are moving and you are not happy. You are in pain. So what are the forces in the y direction? What do we have? T1 sine of theta. So that's pointing upward. We have T1 sine of theta has to equal what? Oh, actually sine 40, right? We use theta is 40 for both of them. equals T2 sine 40. Since sine 40 is the same on both sides, that tells me what? T1 has to equal to T2. 
So they are equal to each other here. The tension, these strings will be equal. How much? We have no idea. Now what about in the x direction? We also want some of the force in the x direction to be what? Zero. That means all the forces to the right, if you add them, should equal all the forces to the left. What is going to the right? T1 cosine 40 plus what? T2 cosine 40. And what's going to the left? 150. Since T1 is equal to T2, right? So that's twice one of them. T2 equals T1. If you do a substitution here, you have the same thing. That's two sets of them. T1 cosine of 40 equals what? 75. Can we get what T1 equals to? 75 over the cosine of 40. It's almost 98 Newton. So what is T2? 98 Newton. That wasn't the question, by the way. It's nice and wonderful, but that's not what the question is. The question is how much mass I need to hang there to make sure that pulling force is 150. That's what the question is. How much mass I need to hang here to give me that 150? Well, guess what? If this is T2 right here, guess what this force pulling up is going to be? What is that force going to equal to? It better be the same as this one. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If this is T2, this is T2. This is also 98. So the reason that weight is actually not going anywhere because that force has to be 98. It has to match that one. So let's look at that weight hanging here, this little piece. In case you're still writing, I'll give you a chance to finish it. Let's look right at this picture here, the hanging weight. We have the mass M, which has a weight down of equal what? Mass times gravity. And we have the tension up, we call it T2, which is equal to what? To 98. And you want to make sure that these two are what? Or this one is not moving. If it's not moving, that means what? This force has to equal to this force. So T2 has to equal to mass times gravity. T2 is 98. Mass times gravity, which is 9.8. So what do you have to hang? Is it 10 kilogram? You put 10 kilogram, and now that will make sure this person get 150 foot force pulling in that direction, and that keeps the pressure off his or her foot there. Let's do another one, another string one. Father's Day is coming up soon. And let's say you bought for your dad a plant.
looks like this. And it has a handle on it, has this little basket, beautiful. They come in like that, you've probably seen them with the flowers in it. And let's give it a mass here. It's that nice, heavy. So what do you want to use for a mass? 10 kilogram? Dad, happy Father's Day, right here. If not, Mom, happy Father's Day. And all of a sudden, stuff to Mom. And now you take this to hang it at home. And Mom or Dad, go, oh, where are we going to hang this one? Let's say we have this corner, a porch in the house. There's the porch out there. And you decide you want to attach it horizontally to this end here. Well, if you attach it horizontally to this string here, we'll call it tension one, what will happen to that plant once you let go? It's going to fall down, dangle down here, right? So to make sure it doesn't drop down there, you take another string and you attach it right there. Let's pick an angle. Somebody choose a number. No, just this angle. 32. 32, good. So this cable will say T2. Again, I'm not sure if these tensions in the cable will be equal or not. So you attach it like this. And the question, what is the tension on these cables? Are these strings that we use going to be strong enough to hold that? Because when you buy a string, it says, this will hold up to 10 Newton or 15 pounds or 30 pounds. Is this going to be strong enough to hold that? So let's see. Let's make this my y-axis right smack in the middle. That's my free body diagram almost. You're looking at it. And this is my x-axis. If you put your axes right there, see the forces on it? We got actually three forces acting on that. The three forces is we got the weight down. which is mass times gravity. Mass is 10, gravity is 9.8. This is 98 Newton. We get T1 to the right. And we get T2 in this direction. And that angle is what, 32? And we're assuming this plant is not moving. Stationary, equilibrium. Just hanging there. So we're going to take that T2 and break it down to X and Y components. So again, here we go. This is what? The 98. This is T1, and that T2 can be broken down to a component in this direction and one upward. The one to the left is what? T2, cosine what? 32. The one upward is what? T2, sine 32. Again, we're assuming we have equilibrium. It means nothing is moving. We use that term a lot, or that word a lot, equilibrium. We have a balanced system. Nothing is moving. If nothing is moving, if you're in equilibrium, it means some of the forces in the y direction is zero. The net force, which means what? All the forces pointing upward should equal all the forces pointing down. We also use some of the forces in the x direction as zero. When you have equilibrium, nothing's moving. All the forces to the right should equal all the forces to the left, if you add them. That's what equilibrium means. You have stationary system. Just hang in there.
So if I use these two equations, up equals down, left equals right, what is pointing upward? Look at that equation. I mean the free body diagram down here. What is pointing upward? T2 sine of 32. T2 sine of 32 equals what is pointing down, which is what? 98. 98. Can we solve for T2? Yep. What's T2 equal to? 98 divided by the sine of 32. 185. Let's use left equals right. What do we have uh, to the right? T1. What do we have to the left? T2 cosine 32. We know what T2, we just solved for it right here. 185 times the cosine of 32. Is it 157? So there's a tension in each cable. So when I go and buy my strings from Lowe's or Home Depot, I know to make sure I buy a string that will hold at least two or three hundred newton here. And this is a little bit less. Dylan, go ahead. There's no uh, normal force in this one? No. Normal, that's when it's sitting on the ground, something pushing up on it. Okay. So we don't have that situation. If this plant was on the ground instead of hanging there, then yes, you do have a normal force pushing upward. Any other questions on this? Okay. Now what about springs? So we said strings and springs. Now we saw what strings do for us. Like there's a string, there's a string, the tension in them. What about when you have a spring? We use actually the spring, remember that projector? No, we didn't do that. Yeah, we did, that's our experiment. Confusing the day class with the night class. Remember that when we fired that spring up in the air, that projectile, that little ball there, then off the table to see where it's gonna land? Well, we compressed that spring, then we released it. Well, when you have a spring there, let's look at springs. If I take a spring like this, it's a coil, and I compress it. Now, normally, let's say it's sitting like this, sitting like, like this one. It's not touch, it's just, that's the length of it. The natural, if you just let it sit by itself, not, it'll look like this. But if, it, if I take that spring now and I compress it, and I can make it, it stops here. What will happen if you push on it? That spring has a force, which way is it pushing? It's actually pushing what? Pushing in this direction. Right? If you let it go, or if you attach like a little ball to it, that ball will go flying in that direction. Also, if you take that coil and you stretch it, and you stop here, this has a force pulling which way when you let it go now? In that direction. So when you compress it, it wants to release and push back. Well, you compressed it x distance. That distance from here to there is actually x, or delta x. That's the compression. In this case, you stretched it. That distance here, you stretched it, delta x. So what's the force then by a spring that's compressed or stretched? The force is negative k or, there we go. The force by a spring, what do we use, Fs here? Can't tell if our book uses Fs for force of a spring. 
They just use Fx, actually. Because S is, if you use Fs, people confuse it with what? Static friction? F of X, it's negative K times X. It's always backward. Why? When you push X to the right, which way the force? To the left. When you stretch it, you're pulling X to the left, which way the force? To the right. So it's always backward to the distance X that you move X, either compressed it or stretched it. It's always going to point in one opposite direction to where you did to X. If you stretch X to the left, the force to the right. If you compress that spring, that means X was pushed to the right, then F will be to the left there. So that's the equation that we use for a spring. The force by a spring, it's negative K times X. And X is that delta X, right? The, yeah, how much you compressed it or stretched it, exactly. If you, the, the minus way to indicate the direction, the value of that, the magnitude is K times X. And the minus tells you the direction of it, it's backwards. So for example, if I have a, a spring here, and this is the length of it, normally let's say it's one meter long, it's a long spring. And now I take it and I compress it to 0.8 meters. I compress that string how much? 0.2. So the force here, the F is going to be pointing in this direction because you compressed it. And what's the value of that? The value of that is going to be what? K. I need to tell you what K for that spring is. Mm. That's a constant. Every spring has a spring constant. What is K? I know the distance is 0.2, but I don't know what K is for that spring. That's the value of it. So if I know what K is, I can tell you that. Well, how do we know what K for a spring? If I will come in with a spring and say, there's a spring for you. Tell me what K is. Is that always going to be negative K? Well, the equation is negative KX, and the negative to indicate the direction. So I already know the direction is going to be here to the left, Dominic. So I put that to the left, and the value of that, I'm going to calculate that with this. But my biggest obstacle, how do you find what K is? Uh, well, that one had told me what K is. Obviously, heavier springs have a larger value of K, strong ones. Like in your car, you have these shock absorbers. When you hit a bump, your car goes up and down. Those coils are massive, you know, so the car doesn't go that much. Toys, they have a little tiny spring on them. It doesn't take much to squeeze them. Well, the way we calculate what K is for a spring, if I don't have, if somebody didn't tell me what that is, I'll take the spring and hang it upside down. I'll take a nail or a hook there and hang the spring. And let's say the length of it is right there, stops right there. Then I'll go and I'll get a weight, something, a mass, like let's say one kilogram, half a kilogram, whatever I want to use. And I'll attach that half kilogram to it. And what's going to happen is going to stretch that string. And let's say I attach here what? 0.5 kilogram. I measure how far did that spring get stretched. What was that distance? I'll go and measure that. Somebody pick a number, any number you want to, reasonable number. 10 centimeters, which is 0.1 meters. I heard 10, Diana says 10. So 0.1 meter. Let's say the thing stretched 0.1, 10 centimeters, not a lot. We stretched it this much. That's 10 centimeters by putting half a kilogram. How is that going to help me find what K for the spring is? Well, let's look at the spring here. Let's look at right here. There's nothing in the X direction. But in the Y direction, what do you have? In the Y direction, we have what? We have the weight down. Which weight? That weight I hung there, right? which is mass times gravity, 0.5 times 9.8, and that's what? 4.9. What else we have? What's pulling up on it? The spring is pulling up. Up. 
So the, the sign tells me which direction. And what's the value of that force? How big is that force? Same. It, isn't it k times x? Because that's a spring. The force by, by the spring is always k times x. That's the value of it. And the minus is the direction. And the fact this weight is stationary, is hanging in the air, is now moving up or down, that tells me we have equilibrium. And if it's equilibrium, what does that mean about the forces pointing upward and downward? They must be equal to each other. So what do we have pointing upward? K times X. What do we have pointing down? 4.9. X is what? Point 0.1 equals 4.9. What is K equal to? 4.9 over point 0.1, which means what? 49. What do you think the units for K is? Here's the equation for the force. Negative KX, right? What is the unit for the force? Newton. I don't know what the unit for K is, unknown. What's the unit for X? Meter, right? Can you solve it for K? Isn't that Newton over meter? So the unit for K is 49 Newton per meter. What does that mean? That means if you take that spring and you can stretch it one meter, that force pulling back will be equal to 49 Newton. 49 Newton for every meter that you stretch it. So if you stretch it two meters, you're going to have what? 98. If you stretch it half a meter, you're going to have half that number. But it's 49 Newton for every meter that you stretch it or compress it. So that's how we find K for these. And I'll add to that the last thing because I know there's other stuff I want to do, but I'll try to wrap them up on Monday there. I want to talk about circular motion, maybe a couple more examples, and send you home. Notice this is what we did in the lab yesterday, so hopefully you have your notes with you to look and see how we did. Remember that experiment we did? So I'm skipping that for now. Hopefully you can look at the notes from the lab, from the experiments, and figure out what the acceleration, all that. If not, we'll review that on Monday. But I want to add the last piece, last piece, which is circular motion, when things are spinning. spinning something in a circle there. If something's spinning in a circle, you're holding, for example, you take a string, you attach to it a stone, you're spinning that stone. That stone is going in a circle. Now, what will happen if you let go of that string here, what will happen to that stone? We'll go flying. Which way? Well, if I'm spinning in this direction, it will go flying in that direction, tangential. That's the direction it will fly. If I'm spinning clockwise, it will go flying in this direction. If I release it right here, it will go in that direction. If I release it here, it will go in that direction. If I release it here, it's going to go in this direction, tangent to that. So it depends where you release that st uh, string there, the stone will go flying. But you're going to find out there is an acceleration toward the center. It's called centripetal acceleration, ACP. Centripetal acceleration.
let's assume this distance is r and this is moving at a certain speed v has a velocity v so the central acceleration is equal to v squared over r So that's called centripetal acceleration. Sometimes it goes center sequence, toward the center. It's always that centripetal acceleration is going pointing in that direction, toward the center of it. Well, if you remember Newton's second law, it says the net force equals what? Mass times acceleration. So what's the centripetal force? It's the mass times the acceleration, which is mv squared over r. So F centripetal, if you want it's centripetal force now, it's mass times velocity squared over r, or mv squared over r. We love that centripetal force. If you ever been to uh, the fairs there, you go on the ride. I don't know what this ride is called. What is it? Swings? There's no fancy word for it, just the swings? Okay. You send the swings, start to spin, what happens? You go to the outside. The only way to keep you and somebody going to hold the tire string to you and pull you back in. And we can calculate what that force is. So it makes it fun. Oh, I'm going to the outside. The faster they go, the higher you go. You almost, if they go really fast, you're going to be even with that one. Almost. Straight out. They're not like on an angle? Well, they're on an angle. But if you go really, really fast, you know, either that rope is going to snap, it's going to look like almost horizontal with it. So it's kind of fun, but that's not where the fun actually for that force is. The fun for it is when you're on the road. If you're a race car driver and you're racing, you go on high speed turn. We use that logic. There's a force actually, you know, is gonna push you off that track. And that force is equal to mv squared over r. The only reason you don't get off the track is why? The static friction, because if you are making a turn, let's say there's, you're being chased by the cop. There we go. There's the cruisers behind you. There's the road, the two-lane highway, and you are flying here in your car. Let's see, you got a speed here, velocity. You look at your speed, the speedometer in the car, it says you go in 110 miles per hour. Remember, you've been chased here. And the radius of that are equals what we use for a number 50 meters now if you have good tires on your car you're probably going to stay on the track if you don't have good tires we got a little problem now assuming your car did not slip if the car did not slip when you made that turn well, what kept the car on the track? If you look at the car, there's two forces. One of them wants to push it off the track. Just like when you're on the swing, this right here. The minute it starts to turn, it's going to push you to the outside. So there's a force that's going to push you to the outside here. And what's that force? mv squared over r. That's your centripetal force. What kept you from going off the track or the road? Which friction? Static friction. static friction. The car is moving. Why isn't kinetic friction? Because I'm talking about there's moving in this direction. There's kinetic friction in this direction. But in the other direction, the car is not slipping. So in that direction, that car was not moving. So what kept you there is the static friction pulling down, which is what? Mu S times N.
assuming you have good tires. Remember, in our book, when we looked at the static friction for tires on concrete between one and four. Let's assume you're good tires, you have a static friction of 2.5. Assume that number. Can we calculate actually how fast? Let's see, how fast can I go on that track and still stay there? Don't skip, start skipping or sliding there. So what is the minimum speed that I can make that turn with without going flying off the road? Well, these two must be equal to each other, right? So m v squared over r equals mu s, which is what? 2.5 times the normal. The normal is what? Isn't that the weight? Mass times gravity? Unless the road is banked. So if the road is flat, what will happen to the two masses here? Notice they cancel each other out. They're on both sides of the equation. V squared equals 2.5 times R times G. V squared equals 2.5 times R times G. R is 50. G is 9.8. Two point five times fifty times nine point eight. It's one two two five. And what is V gonna equal to? Thirty five meters per second. Which, if you want to change it to miles per hour, you go thirty five times two point two four. Seventy-eight point four. As long as you under seventy-eight point four miles per hour, you will stay on the track. Once you go over that, you're done. So one hundred and ten miles per hour. Guess what? Your history. You're on the side screaming, "Ouch! Everything hurts." So you would have to get down to that speed to make. You have to yep that speed or lower. The only other option is you have really good good tires where have a larger value. You know. Most of us, our cars probably don't have a 2.5, even if you have good, good tires, you know. You got to have a rough road. You got to have really big, heavy, those rough, rough tires, like rubbery, sticky to, to get that high value. But an average tire is probably 1.5, you know, 1.6. And if it's raining, that number shrinks to half the number. So now if it's raining, that mu s instead of 2.5, probably below 1 or 1. And if it's ice in it, that's probably a point six, point five. It becomes worse and worse. But that's what keeps us actually on the track there. I don't know if you've seen the movie Apollo 13 and Tom Hanks in that movie doing zero gravity. That wasn't fake. That was actually zero gravity. Well, how they did the zero gravity there? NASA has a plane called the Comet Vomit. True, true, actually. It's not something I'm making up. It's called the Comet Vomit. It's one of those big planes. They took all the seats out. And uh, the name Vomit, you know, from what? You know where they come up with that name. And the way they do it, that plane actually will fly circular path, like this, half a circle, at a certain speed. So what they do, they take the plane, and they, they have a radius they can fly at. And it will fly like this. It keeps going like this. So when you hit the spot like this, they know what the radius of that circle is. Let's say the radius is a thousand meters. Now, at what speed they need to fly the plane? Because from here to there, they want to simulate zero gravity. So at what speed we need to fly that plane to give me the zero gravity right there? When you reach the point, the top point here, what do you have acting on you? You got your weight down, and you got what? Centripetal force, which is mv squared over r. That's the two forces on you. If I can make them equal to each other, what will happen? You got zero g, zero gravity. 
and you float in the air. If I make this value higher than this, what will happen? You'll go flying, you stick to the ceiling of the plane. So you can actually walk on the ceiling of the plane. If I make it lower, this value is bigger than that, you can walk on the floor of the plane. So when you see people like in some commercial, they're walking on a ceiling, it's like, how do they walk on a ceiling? Well, that's probably Hollywood, but you can actually walk on a ceiling of the plane if you make that value bigger. How? Increase the speed. I can tell you what speed will give me a zero gravity. That means you're just going to float in the air. So if the plane goes up or down, you are just floating in the air. And that's how you simulate zero gravity. So looking at these numbers, I said, let's say a thousand ra meter radius here. The weight of the plane is mass times gravity, or the weight of the person. Notice the mass weight is not a factor because they do cancel each other out. Mass will cancel. We have what? V squared over R equals to G. V squared equals R times G. Or V equals the square root of R times G. It's not a complicated math equation, nothing. You know the radius of the plane they're going to fly at. They got us to fly a thousand uh, meter radius. Just keep going like this in a circle within a thousand meter. So if you do that, R is a thousand, G is 9.8, take the square root of that number, fly the plane at a velocity of uh, 98, about 99 meters per second, which is approximately times 2.24. That's 222 miles per hour. You do that because the, the radius is really small radius. That's a thousand meters sounds a lot. That's not a lot. A thousand meters is very small. Half a mile. Half a mile of the plane going, you know. It's usually most planes travel 600 miles per hour, 500 miles per hour. So that radius has to be way bigger than that, a thousand. And that's what they do actually. They make a radius maybe 2,000 or 3,000. And for a short time, you have actually zero gravity. If you keep going in a circle, when you get to the bottom, what happens to you when you're on the bottom? You got twice the force, 2G on you, why? Because you got MV squared over R pushing down, and you got what? You got the weight pushing down. So when you're on the bottom of that run there, you're feeling twice gravity on your body. On the top, you have zero gravity. When you're right here, at this point, you got one in this direction, that's MV squared over R, and you get the weight down this direction, which is mg. But that's how they did the movie Apollo 13. They used the common vomit for that plane. And they kept just doing that and taking snap video, little video of 30 seconds, 15 seconds of zero gravity. And they do the experiment using just basic physics. <laughs>